Good morning, everybody. Come on, good morning. We're from Mississippi. We're the hospitality state. And so we believe in being nice. And so when people say good morning, you say good morning back. Good morning, everybody. Ah, that's what I'm talking about. I'm just so glad to be here. In fact, I'm just glad to be out the house. And uh, when, when I got the call, we've been locked down in Mississippi for a year. So this is my first time getting out, first time flying. And, and when I got the call, uh, my concern wasn't flying. My concern was whether or not my suit fit because I had gained some COVID weight. Uh, come on now, don't act like y'all didn't gain any COVID weight. Yeah, well, we're so excited to be here to celebrate the man of God of the house. Come on, let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> Notice I said man of God and not man of God. Because whenever somebody say man of God, that means they're getting ready to get deep. We're not getting ready to get deep. We're going to have some fun today. Y'all ready to have some fun in church? All right, I'm glad. I'm so glad to be here, uh, my friend and my brother. I mean, he is one of the most authentic people that you can meet. I remember when I first met him, we were, I think it was at a conference uh, in Cleveland, Ohio, and um, I said, man, who is the little guy here, the teenager that's in here? Because he looks so young, you know, before he had the beard and all of that. And so I'm so glad that uh, I had an opportunity to meet him. And you never know when somebody crossed your paths. Uh, I remember when uh, in Genesis 1 it said, and God created uh, light and there was light. But the notice that the sun and the moon wasn't created till the sixth day. So sometimes God will do things and explain it later. And so now I understand, you know, the purpose uh, that uh, in our meeting or what have you. And so I'm just so excited uh, about what God is doing in his life. Uh, you have to understand your pastor is known across the country. I mean, any, anytime you got a guy that can text Michael Todd and John Maxwell, uh, sometimes we don't recognize the gifts that we have in the body. So uh, celebrating your pastor today is a great thing. And so I'm here uh, to celebrate him. But I don't just want to say anything about him because I know that he wouldn't be half the man he is without the lady that's next to him. Come on, let's give a round of applause for Lady Jocks. Yeah, she, she is a contributing factor. He has an anointing on his life, but it's amazing to have a strong woman uh, in your life. And uh, I want to shout out mine. I know she's watching. Uh, shout out to Lady Ty, uh, the love of my life for 21 years, for 21 years. So I've been married. So, yeah, but we, we, we've had a great relationship, and uh, he is one of the few people that I can call and brag to and like, past I just got a half a million dollar contract. Past I got a seven hundred thousand dollar contract. And and so you can, you, I call and I can brag. We brag to each other and we can bump things off each other. And so I'm just excited to call you my friend and my brother. Uh, so we thank you and we celebrate you uh, today. Uh, I believe I have some special guests here today too. Some of my Word Center members who moved to Orlando are here today. Come on, I see it. The Kate King, Jeremy Jones, and the Quinty Campbell. Let's give them a round of applause. That brother is the only brother I know that in 2020 stayed in his apartment the whole year and made nearly a million dollars from his apartment. Uh, been on the Food Network and a few other things. And so uh, great, uh, great guy right there, businessman. And so thank you guys for coming out and supporting. I'll make sure I want to see you after service or what have you. Just uh, real quick, I got a product. I brought uh, my book. Uh, I wrote a book called The Pain of Pastoring. And I wrote this book so that parishioners can peek behind the peripheries of what goes on in a pastor's life. Because many times we're juggling so many things and uh, we're in so much pain, but many times our members, they're not, uh, they're not knowing exactly what's going on behind the scenes. So it's kind of like a fraternity or a sorority where there's this pledging process that nobody knows about. And so pastoring is kind of one of those things. And so I wrote it to parishioners. I wrote it to young pastors so that they can understand that, the, you know, everything about the pastorate is not a glory spot. And so I only brought a few of them because I, I wanted to make this day about him, but uh, they're in the lobby. So uh, feel free to grab one of those, especially the leaders, so that you can understand uh, your pastor. Amen. Let's get ready to jump in the word of God. Are you ready today? Amen. Come on, TKC. I need some energy today. Are y'all ready? Amen. Uh, amen. Let's get ready to pray. Father, I just thank you, God. I pray that you would anoint me with your efficacious anointing. God, I pray that you would think through my mind and speak through my vocal cords. Father, make it plain, God. I thank you for the freedom and the liberty, Father God, to speak to your people, God. Let what I say be a seed, Father, that's planted. For we know that one man planteth another water, but you shall hear the increase, Father God. Anoint me, Father God, that burdens may be lifted and yokes may be destroyed, Father. I thank you for this beautiful ministry, Father. 
Father God. And I thank you that this is just a preview to the movie that's getting ready to come, Father. Father, I thank you that as a result of everyone who has contributed, everyone who has sold, Father God, that you would give it back to them 100-fold, Father. God, I thank you for all of the TKC family that's watching right now. God, I thank you for each and every person, Father, that's in this place today, God. Stir up this gift in here today, God. We honor you. We give you the glory. We give you the honor. We give you the praise. Somebody shout in Jesus' name. Hey, Amen. Let me put my timer on. I'm not long-winded at all. Hey, Amen. Let's get ready. If you have your Bibles, if you have your Bibles, let's go to 2 John. 2 John. Chapter 1. Reading one passage of Scripture. 2 John, incredible job to everyone who came before me, uh, incredible job to the praise team, to the mind ministry, to the dance team, and to the band over there, incredible voice, uh, amen, such an anointed ministry, and so many anointed leaders. Let's give a round of applause for the staff that helps out, amen, uh, because I, I, I was watching and I, I just noticed that. Uh, they operate in such high excellence, amen. In fact, if I was here in Orlando, this would be my church, amen, for all you visitors. Uh, just a seed right there, amen. Second John 1 and 8, it says this, watch yourselves that you do not lose what you have accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. I, I want to speak from a thought for a few moments. Do it for the culture. Do it for the culture. Every organization, every company has a culture. That culture is a blueprint. A blueprint is a set of plans that are designed for the builder or the contractor to build to those specifications. If there are going to be fireplaces in the building, it'll be on the blueprints. If there are going to be doors in certain places, it's going to be on the blueprints. If there are going to be plugs and plumbing and the height and the pitch of the roof, it's going to be on the blueprints. And one of the greatest things about starting a ministry is that you get an opportunity to place whatever you want on the blueprints. In fact, you get to instill your DNA. In fact, when you start a ministry, you get an opportunity to customize to the contour and the continuity of your liking. Well, but over time, regardless of what you build, regardless of what's on the blueprints, over time, things can kind of wane. Things can kind of get old and fade, and after a while that you've built the new house, the new house smell kind of goes away, the carpet begins to fade, and the paint on the wall begins to fade, and uh, the furniture begins to get outdated, even the fixtures can get outdated, so sometimes it needs some updates, but those things are very visible, you can see those things. However, after a while you build a house from the ground up, you know, there are some things that happen inside the house that the average person cannot see. You cannot see it with the naked eye. Yeah, these are things like uh, the hot water heater begins to build up calcium and it begins to put pressure on the water lines and as a result, the pressure begins to lower. The skin on the roof begins to not protect the building from the outside elements. The foundation begins to shift. These are things that are not as visible as other things. Sometimes you need a professional like me who's in the contracting business to come in and say, hey, you have hail damage, you have straight wind damage. And uh, as a result, we're able to see things that the average person may not see. So sometimes you do have to call in a professional. But the same pathology I noticed in contracting exists in organizations. Yeah, uh, sometimes things can begin to wane and sometimes things can become overlooked because we don't have the eye to be able to see it. Now, I want you to catch this. One of the elements of the church that can kind of wane over a period of time, unknowingly, unintentionally, but may have intentional results, is this thing called honor. Somebody say honor. honor. I've counted honor was said about eight to ten times in this service today. Somebody say honor. Honor. I want to talk for a few moments about honor. This is exactly what uh, the Apostle Peter talked about in 1 Peter 3 and 7 when he commanded husbands to give honor to their wives. And so he was allowing us to peek in the peripheries of what honor is and how to honor. And so I uh, understand this, that although this has multiple meanings, honor in its very rudimentary form, it refers to a calculated decision to show attention, uh, to show awareness or to give consideration. 
restoration. In fact, what Peter was saying, he was basically trying to admonish men to respectfully and purposefully show attention and consideration to their wives. And so he was letting us know about this word honor. In other words, you don't just honor accidentally. You don't just honor by mistake. Rather, the word paints a picture of purposeful and premeditated action. Yeah, in other words, I shouldn't just hear honor, I should feel honor. I shouldn't just hear honor, but I should experience honor. I shouldn't just see honor, but I also should experience, and I should uh, really, really know that I'm honored when honor is there. Are you following me? Well, why the word honor, Pastor? Honor carries this connotation. It carries this, this connotation or this idea of something that's valuable, something that's precious, something that's a treasure. In other words, when you honor something, you value it. When you value it, you take care of it. Amen. Amen. Right. And, and so it carries this connotation that, 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 that something that's cherished. In fact, uh, the apostle uh, Peter, he paints this picture on the canvas of our imagination that, that honor is something to be very treasured. In fact, many of you right now, you have your, your doors locked at your homes. You have your doors locked at your houses because uh, you have things of value there. So you protect what you honor. Now, I love this because honor is so important that when you have a culture of honor in a community or in a church, it can shift the entire culture. It's important to have this because sometimes changing one thing can fix everything. You, you see, just like in a relationship, uh, when it comes to the big three, communication and love making and finances, what I found that in doing relationship counsel across the country is that sometimes when you change one thing, it fixes everything. When you change communication, the finances would change. When you change communication, the parental guidance would change. When you change communication, the love making will change. So this is why it's important that you work on communication because when you change one thing, watch this, you can actually change other things. Are you following me? You guys do a great job here at Honoring. You guys do a great job. So I'm not here to teach you about honor. I'm here to really present to you uh, to, and celebrate the man of God, but stir up, the, stir up the culture of honor here. What do you mean, Pastor Richard? It was in Timothy when he said, stir up the gift that's in you. That, that Greek word there means to fan the flames as if it's getting ready to go, go out. So sometimes we got to fan the flames even in our marriages, in our relationships. We have to fan the flames in our business because sometimes the flame can go out and so we we got to fan it before it goes out so that we can make sure we maintain the same equanimity, maintain the same fire that we had when we first met them. Sometimes you got to fan the flames. Somebody say fan the flames. Yeah, see, uh, one thing that I, I, understand, I understand here is that sometimes we don't appreciate things we have access to. When I got off the plane, man, I was like a kid in a candy store. I'm looking at the palm trees. But see, you guys don't pay attention to the palm trees because you have access to the palm trees. And I'm seeing the Disney buses, and I'm sending pictures to my daughter, and I'm sending pictures to my wife, and say, look at the Disney buses. I'm excited because we're in the land of Disney. But I know sometimes because you live here, you're like, oh, Disney, oh, all these tourists in here. Because when you have access to it, sometimes you don't appreciate it like everybody else. And so I'm, I'm like, wow, it was hard for me to sleep. I'm looking at the water and I'm looking at the palm trees because, see, I'm from the state of Mississippi. See, we got mosquitoes. So, 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 so I'm excited to be here because we don't normally have access to the things that you guys see every day. And so many times we don't appreciate the things we have access to. And one thing that I learned, Pastor David, uh, is that sometimes the absence of, uh, sometimes, mm, how I want to say this. What, what I've learned is that the absence of honor is not always the presence of dishonor. Sometimes the absence of honor is the presence of familiarity. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so just because, you know, somebody's not honored don't mean they're being dishonored. Sometimes we get so familiar with something and so familiar with some things that it, we don't dishonor them. We become familiar with them. So as a result, we don't appreciate them like we could. See, see, understand often, watch this now, we don't even accept wisdom from people that are close to us because their voice have become common to us. 
See, this is why we got to be careful of become, coming, becoming so familiar with your pastor and with your leaders that you don't honor them and you don't value them because you have access to them, because you can call them, because you can text them, because they answer your inbox. And so we got to be so ever careful that we uh, ultimately become so familiar that we're not honoring them. So you say, well, Pastor Rich, how do I actually honor my pastor? How do I fan the flames of honor and create the culture of honor here at TKC? I'm glad you asked. And just in case you didn't ask, I'm going to tell you anyway. Amen. First thing, come on, write this down. Honor him with your presence. Yeah, one thing I've learned in counseling, during relationship counsel all across the country uh, is that sometimes it's not the words you say or the things you do. Sometimes people just need your presence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so sometimes you don't have to say anything when somebody loses a loved one. It's your presence. As the young man just said that, that, that he canceled his vacation, he cut his vacation short just to give him his presence. See, it's, under, it's understandable that your pastor, watch this, he, he, he wants you here. And there, those of you who are watching, those of you who are watching online, you may have not come uh, yet because of COVID. We understand that. But you know, your pastor, he needs your energy here in the sanctuary. He wants to see you. He wants to hug your neck. If you never come, he never gets an opportunity to see your kids grow. He never gets the opportunity uh, to know about what Jesus is doing in your life. He doesn't get an opportunity to hear about the many testimonies uh, of what's, what's going on in your life, what God is doing in your life. You have to honor him with your presence. Plus, you got a pastor that'll jump out on you. Yeah, he'll show up at your house. Yeah, you got a pastor that, yeah, because your pastor can get a little petty sometimes now. Come on now, how many of y'all know what I'm talking about? I, I saw in a post the other day, he said, uh, glad to see you. You fired me as your pastor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he can get a little petty sometimes, and, and that's okay. But watch this, it's because he loves you. He loves you enough to correct you. He loves you enough to, to say, hey, I hadn't seen you in a while. Where have you been? Because he needs your presence. Amen. Are you following me? Now, I want you to imagine this. How many of you all have, you've ever broke up with somebody, divorced or separated? Just by a show of hands. Just by a show of hands. You, you went through a divorce. You broke up with somebody, your boyfriend, your girlfriend. I want you to just show of hands. If you broke up before, come on, it's okay. It's, this is not a trick question. It's not a trick question. Come on, just show your hand. I want y'all to look around. Come on, raise your hands. Raise your hands. Do you remember the pain of how that felt? Now, I want you to understand that whenever you have a decent-sized church, there are people who leave every week. And the way that it feels, it feels like we're going through a breakup every week. Yeah, every week. Somebody left for reasons known, sometimes unknown, but... This is important. See, you have a church where, you know, you, you have substantial size and there are people who leave. You say, well, we have so many people. If they leave, three more come. No. Every time somebody leaves, it feels like a breakup. It feels like a divorce. It feels like a separation. Are you following me? This is critically important. Um, not only honor him with your presence. Watch this now. I'm getting ready to say something. The Holy Spirit. Not only honor him with your presence, I want you to honor him with your goodbyes. So in other words, when their season is up and your season change, honor him enough to say, Pastor, hey, I'm going in a different direction. You've been good to me. Your wife has been good to me. I've learned so much at TKC. Honor him enough to say, Pastor, I'm getting ready to leave. Come on, don't, don't let Pastor know that you're going to another church by chance ch sharing the other church's broadcast. Am I in the house? So honor him with your presence. Honor him with your goodbyes. But watch this now. Honor him with your prayers. Yeah, see, I, I know this sounds cliche-ish uh, or what have you, but see, the assumption is that we know that prayer is a fundamental Christian, uh, Christian principle. We know that it's a fundamental, uh, rudimentary element uh, in Christianity. And the assumption is that just because I'm Christian, I pray. But the stats show that the average Christian don't pray for themselves. So if the average Christian doesn't pray for themselves, then we know they're not praying for their pastor. I, I need you to really hear this uh, or what have you. See, I, I want you to understand that pastors, we go through so much. We have to walk people through so much. Uh, get calls two and three in the morning because somebody's child was touched inappropriately. 
We've had to walk people through multiple miscarriages and they've been believing God and standing in agreement to have a child and yet miscarriage after miscarriage and we have to walk them through that, through that pain and see, we have to help other people process their pain while we interpret ours. God, did you hear what I just said? See, see, prayer is it, essential for so many reasons. I can just talk about prayer just the rest of the time, and, and but that's not what I'm here. I'm here to really touch on some stuff and stir up the culture. But even prayer is essential for so many reasons. But watch this. For a natural reason, it's hard to talk about somebody you're praying for. Yeah, so, 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 so when something happens, a disagreement happens, when you're praying for pastor, you're not going to talk about pastor. You're not going to spread anything crazy. 2 Timothy 2 and 2 says, pray for the kings and those who are in authority over you that you may live a peaceable and a quiet life. See, understanding praying for your pastor, man, it will actually help improve your life. We heard it in the testimonies of the many brothers that are here today. Amen. See, I, I want you to understand, your pastor, he has Superman qualities. And just like I, I talked about in my book, I, I didn't talk about the Superman qualities of pastors. I talked about the Clark Kents. There are times when your pastor get angry. There are times when your pastor get down and depressed. There's times when your pastor can't sleep because he's thinking about you and what you just shared with him in counsel. He's thinking about your marriage, yet he has to deal with the frivolities of his. He has to deal with the challenges in his own life. He's dealing with you and advising you how, how to lead your kids, but yet you have to remember he has children as well. You see, so he's helping carry the burden. I want you to consider this. No one would go to a doctor's office and ask for, ask for legal advice. No, nobody. Who, who would do that here? Who would go to your doctor's office and ask for legal advice? Well, the church is the only place where people will come to us, they ask for medical advice, they ask for legal advice, they ask for business advice, they ask for marital advice, they ask for custody advice, they ask all of these things, and we have to have so many hats. And of course, you got a pastor who is astute in business, so he's able to do various things, but I want you to understand, we don't just do spiritual stuff. So we have to be astute in all of these different things, and you never know what hat you're going to have to wear. I'm going to tell you the story, and I, I, I've never told the story publicly or what have you. Now, we've been closed down over a year. We haven't went back to in-person services yet, right? And um, so I decided to do a little training for my pastors while we're out. And so I get one of the pastors in, and I'm getting ready to, to train him on how to do marital counseling. And so he comes to the church. He calls me, and I'm in the office doing the little work. And uh, as I'm coming out of the employee wing, I'm coming out of the employee wing, I look down, and there is a raccoon that's up to my knee. Now, I'm a country boy. I've been hunting raccoons for a long time. This was the biggest raccoon I've ever seen in person in my life. So I take off running to the door to open the door for my pastor. The raccoon takes off running the other way. So when I get to the door, I'm visibly scared. I'm like, ah, there's a raccoon up in here, right? And so I open the door. I'm like, Pastor Lincoln, go get your gun. Go get your gun, man. There's a raccoon in here, and he's huge. Somebody say huge. He's huge. And so he runs to the, his car and get his gun. And you got to understand, Pastor Lincoln is a former globetrotter. He's, he's about seven feet tall. So he comes back with this little bitty 380. I said, man, what you going to do with that? That little old gun is not going to do anything. And, you know, I'm known to carry my pistol, so I have my pistol on my side. And so here it is. He comes in the door, and I'm, and I'm peeking around the corner. And here it is. Sure enough, there go the raccoon on all fours. On all fours, he's this big to my knee. That's a huge raccoon. And so he's coming toward me. So I pull out my gun. And I'm shooting in the church. <laughs> Don't tell nobody about this. Hope my member's not watching. So, so I shoot at the raccoon for the first time, and I missed it, and it hits the ground. It ricochets, goes through the wall, goes out the back wall. I was like, man, I missed him. So he takes off running after the, uh, uh, because of the loud noise, and he runs into this dark room. And we just so happened was getting our carpet clean, so we had chairs stacked up to the, almost to the ceiling. And so, you know, it's very dark in there, and we're scared to go in the room because, hey, if you know anything about a raccoon, a raccoon will actually stand up to a bear. 
And so, so we, we're a little afraid, and he's on the phone with, with animal control and the police department, and, and we're looking under the chairs. We're trying to see some glowing eyes. And I said, Pastor Lincoln, don't them things kind of climb? And we looked up at the same time. We looking at him, and he looking at us. So, so, so I take out my gun, and boom, I hit him. Hit him. He falls to the ground. I say, man, we got him, man. Ooh, we got him. Oh, man, we, we breathing hard. Our hearts are beating. And all of a sudden, we hear, oh, my God. It's another one in here. He didn't fell through the roof. Oh, my God. So we run to the other room, and just sure enough, this huge raccoon is climbing up the wall. Boom, hit him. Shot two raccoons. Yeah, in church. In church. He falls to the ground. He dies, and I'm like, man, this is crazy, man. Get critical control on the line. Get critical control on the line. And as we're walking, we hear something above us. I'm like, oh, man. Three raccoons. What's the moral to the story, Pastor? I didn't wake up that morning thinking I was going to be David Crockett. Because that's how pastoring is, that sometimes you got to turn on a dime. You don't know what you're going to be that day. You don't know if you're going to have to console someone. You don't know if you're going to have to, 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 to lift up someone. You don't know if you're going to have to give somebody some business advice. And so that's how pastoring is. It can be just that crazy at times. And so this is why it's important for you to really lift up your passion. I, I love how Paul, he gave this brief testimony of just what it takes in dealing with the church. Let's go here. Turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians 11, Paul said this in the New Living Translation. He says, are they servants of Christ? He says, I know they sound like a madman, but... I have served him far more. I have worked harder, been put in prison more often, been whipped times without number, and faced death again and again. Five different times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and a day adrift at sea. I have traveled on many long journeys. I have faced danger from rivers and robbers. I have faced danger from my own people, the Jews as well as the Gentiles. I have faced danger in the cities, in the deserts, on the seas, and I have faced danger from the men who have claimed to be believers uh, but are not. Ooh, that, that's, that's enough right there. In other words, I have, he, Paul said, I have to encounter people who came looking one way or seeming one way, but they really wasn't that. In other words, I had to deal with some fake people. He says, I've worked hard and long, enduring many sleepless nights. I have been hungry and thirsty, and I have often gone without food. I have shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. Watch this, verse 28, then besides all this, I have the daily burden of my concern for all the churches. Amen. So you got to realize that as a pastor, not only do we have to deal with outside elements, we got to deal with everything that goes on in the church. So your pastor needs your prayers. Yeah, he, he don't want your prayers. He needs your prayers because the weight of ministry can literally crush you. See, I want, this is why I want you to really, really create this culture of honor him. I, I, I know it doesn't matter that he doesn't like you to carry his Bible and come pick him up for church and all this other stuff. It's not a matter of what he likes at this particular time. It's about you honoring him. It's about you giving him the things that you know that he needs. See, I want you to understand this. Sometimes the pain is so unbearable, and I talked about this in my book, that sometimes it cannot be articulated. Now, I'm not going to ask anybody in here how many of y'all still whoop y'all kids, but maybe you've seen somebody else whoop their kids. Right, it might be social workers up in here. But have you ever seen a child get whooped or they go through so much pain that they open their mouth and nothing comes out? Especially that first lick, they like... And they ain't said nothing. They just, what, what, that's how it is when it's pastoring. It's that sometimes the pain is so unbearable that you can't even articulate it with words. 
Yeah, yeah, it's a glory spot. We love to see people lives change and get saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. That is a joy, but then there is a side that is so painful. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was I was playing with my daughter. See, my daughter's 13 years old, uh, but I, we know coming up, man, I used to kind of play with her a little bit, and we slap box, and we used to play around and stuff like that, and you know, just play. But now she's older; she's 13 now, right? You know, and when she was little, man, I used to let her hit me in the face and all this other stuff, trying to show her how to box and stuff like that. But, you know, she's a gymnast now. She's been in cheerleading and stuff. And she's kind of solid, right? So about a week ago, we were playing around, and she hit me in the stomach. Now, I had to sit there like, girl, that ain't nothing. But internally, I was hurting. I said, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. And, and so she hit me again. And I'm thinking to myself, she hit me again. I'm finna fight her like a man. And she because cause this ain't the three-year-old Taylor. This is the 13-year-old Taylor. And it hurt, but it was so painful. And I realized something. The principle is this. See, the more something grows, the more pain it brings. And so you have to understand that there is a weight a pain, there is, uh, there, there is a pressure that comes with even managing a, ch a church of his size, multiple locations, and doing all the things that he do. There's a pain, there's a weight that comes with it. See, see, if you're here and you don't want him to grow, then you may be in the wrong church. But you got to realize your pastor has been called to be a city changer, a state changer, an influencer. So as it grows, watch this now, your prayers need to grow for him. Am I preaching to somebody in here? You see, so, so understand this, that, 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 that really when it comes to pastoring, and, you know, we often talk about loyalty, but one of the faults of pastoring is that uh, sometimes we try to love the red flags out of people. Yeah, yeah, they, they, they show us who we are, but we believe that Jesus and the power of God can change them. Yet we ignore the red flags and we end up getting hurt. It's like hugging a cactus, and the, the, the harder we hug the cactus, the more we hurt. So, so, so I need you to catch this now because we, we, somebody shout, do it for the culture. We're we going to create a culture of honor here. Uh, next thing, I need you to hear this. Honor him with your service to God. Well, you say, how did that, I'm doing something for God. No, you honor him with your service to God. See, if the church got to pay you for everything, you're not a servant, you're an employee. Psalms 35 says that God pleasures in the prosperity of the servant. In other words, there will be a blessing for you when you serve. I want you to understand this. I, I love church growth. I study church growth. Many churches across the world have been able to, great, been, been able to break uh, growth barriers because, watch this now, they created a culture of honor. They were able to break those, 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 those barriers because skilled workers inside of the church were able to donate their time as opposed to the church paying for it. Imagine that if there was a plumbing problem and a plumber was here and he was able to help mitigate the problem without calling in a plumber who charged thousands of dollars or an electrician who did the same thing. He was able to call an electrician in rather than pay thousands of dollars. He was able to put that back into the community and put that back into you, into you guys. What if it was a young freelance graphic designer who said, you know what, I'm going to build my portfolio, but man, I'm going to sow my time to the church because if you could take that money and put it into something else, then you can help break growth barriers. What would happen if everybody did that? And so we have other cultures of churches that actually do that. They donate their time, their talent, and their treasure. And as a result, they're able to break, uh, break uh, growth barriers. They're able to impact the community. They're able to impact their states. Why? Because they're able to not bust their budget on paying everybody to do something. Amen. Have you considered sowing some of your time so that your church can grow a little bit? Come on, so maybe we can, he can double up on the note and pay off that $2 million. But somebody may be here today and want to want to write a check for $2 million. Amen. Feel free in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 The culture of honor. What if you honored your church by sowing your gift sometimes? Or maybe even if you're an employee, say, you know what, I'm going to donate my, my check back to the church. But I find that many people who even work for the church don't even tithe. Oh, I'm in the house. Y'all ain't going to like me no more, but I ain't got to come back. <laughs> the culture of honor. You can honor. Watch this now, your pastor. Come on, write this down. I'm almost done. Honor your pastor by running with the vision. 
running with the vision. Habakkuk 2 and 2, you know this, the Lord answered and said, record the vision and inscribe it on tablets that one who reads it may run for the vision is yet for the appointed time. It hastens toward the goal and it will not fail. Though it tarries, wait for it for it will certainly come. It will not delay. Um, it was Minister Loomis, Minister Loomis who came and picked me up. And he'll tell you one of the first things that I asked him is, uh, so what's Pastor uh, David's vision for TKC? So give it to me in a nutshell. He gave me his vision in a nutshell. We're to do this. We're trying to do this. We're doing this with businesses and this and that. See, as a member, it's your responsibility to familiarize yourself with the vision. Watch this now. Where you fit and how to help him accomplish your portion. Because everybody has an ethos. Everybody has a cosmos. You have a space in this place. You, you know, uh, he does music. Everybody can't do music. But he's found his place. Bravis, I, I had the opportunity to talk with Bravis over the years. It's my first time seeing him uh, on today, but uh, he does praise and worship. Uh, he has his place. What is your place at TKC? What are you supposed to do? What are you responsible for? Should there have been five or six other people who were miming up here because maybe you got a gift in that, but you were scared to stand up? Maybe you have a voice and you have a beautiful voice singing from the pews. But what if that's the part you're supposed to play? Amen. You got to get in where you fit in. And I understand that it was Aristotle. He didn't coin it, but he popularized it. See, we are greater than the sum of the parts. So you have to understand that you create an incredible synergy when you do your part. It's an incredible energy. You can honor God by, you can honor your pastor by honoring God through your service to the church, to the local church. Well, you got to understand, Pastor, I, I don't agree with everything that goes on here. Um, it was in the book of Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. Nebuchadnezzar the king, he was belittling those three. Uh, he was talking, he was trying to get them to do things that they would not ordinarily do. But there was something that stood out in this particular text uh, of Nebuchadnezzar. Um, notice that Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, they honored Nebuchadnezzar by saying, O king. In other words, that although they disagreed with his tactics and his methods, they did not lose the honor that they had for the position. See, because if you're not careful, watch this, and I, I know that, uh, I hope this don't go over anybody's head. If you're not careful, kind of like looking at the hot water heater, many of you don't really check your hot water heater. Many of you don't know how to look at the roof and tell hail damage. Many of you don't know how to check the pipes for rust and uh, all types of corrosion and lead and all this other stuff. You're calling an expert. But see, the thing about it is that if you're not careful, this thing, honor, you'll begin to lose respect for the position even in how you address him. It goes from Pastor David. David jocks to Pastor David to, to DJ and then all of a sudden you're like what's up bro? Now he may not ever say anything about that but that's Pastor and he should be honored in such a way that you don't create such a familiarity with who he is that you dishonor the position am I in the house? here it is they were still able, to, they honored God and they honored the king. They first honored God by refusing to sin, but then they honored the king by respecting his position. See, disagreement shouldn't equate to dishonor. You can disagree with someone without dishonoring them. I see what your pastor does. He's an incredible businessman. He's been a blessing even to my business and some of the wisdom, especially when it came to real estate. When I wanted to, to, to dibble in, in real estate, he gave me wisdom. So he, he does so many things. He wears so many hats. And so there are so many ways in closing to honor your pastor. But I want you to think about something. I want you to think about what it takes to run your household. I want you to think what it requires from you in life. Think about how would you respond if somebody used your name maliciously? Return it with reciprocity. Don't allow somebody to come with you, especially another member, to say something about your pastor. Say, you do know I'm a tail pastor, right? Yeah, oh, okay, I hear you, but you, you do know I'm a tail pastor, right? Because you're creating a culture of honor. Because one thing that I know about Pastor Jocks is that he's giving you guys access. That you, you go to many other churches, they're not answering your inboxes. You, you can't talk to the pastor. In fact, there are people, even in this city, they don't even know their pastor. And he's giving you access. Access equates to energy. 
And so respect it by giving him the honor that he deserves. The last thing, honor him in your giving. Honor him in your giving. You say, well, I'm not giving it to him, I'm giving it to the church. Yeah, you, what you're doing is you're taking the pressure seat. Now he don't have the pressure to get up here and, and beg. Because you're doing your reasonable part. You, you don't give a tithe, you return a tithe. And, and so you're doing your reasonable part. And so now he doesn't have to worry about anything other than pray and prophesy and preach to you guys and to love you guys and to be there for hospital visits and to be there when you have the babies and to be there when you're getting married. You create a culture of honor and you shift this atmosphere, it'll change the atmosphere all around this city because people will see how you honor. And the seed that you sow in honor to him, God will return it in somebody honoring you. Because the spirit of how you serve is transferred into the spirit of those under you when you get into leadership. Somebody say honor. 2 John 1 and 8 says, watch yourselves that you don't lose what you have accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. Honor's reward is what John Bevere calls it. Create that culture of honor. And there's some of you in here right now who so say, you know what, I can, I can do a better job in honoring my pastor. I, I can do a better job in honoring my first family. I can do a better job at honoring the church. Yeah. And so that's what I wanted to talk about today. Creating that culture of honor. When you have a culture of honor, it shifts the entire place. And so that's what we're doing here today. We're honoring your pastor. And we're honoring him in various ways. But before we move on into the other parts of the service, I, I would be remiss that the, those who are watching, those who are watching, watch this. You can honor the church by even sharing the broadcast. Some of you jump on the broadcast every Sunday and don't even share it. And we know whether you shared it because it says share it. Right? But I want everybody to stand to your feet at this moment. You, you know, as a pastor of other pastors, I pastor other pastors across the country. And so I get an opportunity to live in the basements of other people's problems. I've had to walk pastors who left for the weekend, who came back, and the name of their church was changed, and the doors were, uh, of the church were, were changed, the locks were changed, and, and the board had voted them out. I, I've dealt with pastors who had wives step out on them. I've, I've had, we had to deal with so many different things that you would have no clue. There's a pain in pastoring. Yeah, there's some prosperity in it as well, but there's a pain in pastoring, and this is why, man, he deserves, he deserves double honor, a double portion. I want you to listen to me. Close your eyes. Because there's some of you who just returned to church for the first time. And you're saying, Pastor, I feel good to be here. But I got to step up my game even in my, my personal life, in my holy living. There's somebody here who said, you know what? I'm tired of playing the games. I'm tired of the clubbing. I'm tired of the strip clubs. I'm just tired of paying. I'm, I'm tired of playing. And I, it's time for me to go ahead and accept God into my life. I'm ready to go ahead and, and commit. And, and see, a lot of people think giving your life over to God, it means that you'll stop having fun. Man, I have fun everywhere I go. I laugh. I, I, I joke. I can get deeper with the, deep, with the deep ones. I can speak in eloquent elocution. I can, you know, give you a revelation of the scriptures and stuff like that. But I, I wanted to not get so deep today. But I want to make sure that no matter what we talk about, nothing is more rewarding for a pastor than seeing somebody give their life to the Lord. There's somebody here that says, you know, it's time for me to give my life to the Lord. The second thing I want to talk to you about, there's somebody here that says, you know, I haven't been living the way that I should be living. And I, I knew the Lord, but I, I stepped out and I came back and I stepped out. And I, and I got this love-hate relationship with my flesh and the world. And, you know, I, I, I want to make a commitment today, a public commitment today to change my life. Then there's another invitation I want to give you. There's somebody say, you know what? I've been visiting. 
I've been dating the church for so long. Man, I believe this is the place that I can commit to. Man, I feel the energy. I feel the vibe, the good vibrations, as you call it. I, I feel that this is the place where God is leading me to give my service, to honor, to, to help change the city. I just gave three invitations. But, I, you know, I believe that faith without works is dead according to the scripture. And so there's a part that you have to do. You can sit right there in your seat or you can say, you know what? I'm going to take the courage to step and let the public know because out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. I can sit right there and I can repent, but I want, I'm going to ask you to do something today. I want you to go to the nearest aisle and I want you to come down front. I want to pray over you. Because there's an anointing in here to lift burdens and to destroy yokes. All heads bowed and eyes closed. This is not a spectator. Only people whose eyes should be open are those who are praying for others. First, if you want to give your life to the Lord, you want to, secondly, you want to recommit, or thirdly, you say, I want to find more information on how to join this church. I want you to come down front. I just want to pray for you. We don't believe in calling people out or anything like that. But I believe faith without works are dead. And so you got to put your feet to your faith. And so I want you to come to the nearest aisle. And I want you to come down front. And I want to pray with you. And if you say, well, pastor, I don't, I don't want to come down front. I'm, I'm afraid of, of crowds and all of that. All heads bowed, eyes closed. I want you to raise your hand. I see a hand. See another hand over there. Come now. Make this pu public profession before God. To say, I'm ready to change some stuff in my life. Somebody's here to receive you. See another hand right over there. Yeah. I'm getting ready to pray for you. Yeah. With the hands that were raised and the people who are down front, I'm getting ready to pray for you. I'm going to give you about 10 to 15 more seconds. Put your feet to your faith. Come on down or raise that hand so I can see you and acknowledge that I've seen you. That I've seen you, brother. Everybody pray with me. Pray in your Holy Spirit. Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus for every person that raised their hand and every person that's down front. Today, you said, Father, in your word that, God, if we just acknowledge you, turn from our wicked ways, Father. You said we shall be saved. So, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus as they public profess their love for you and their commitment to you, Father God, that they can come before you clean as white as snow. Father, I thank you for those who said, you know, I want more information about this ministry because I just sense that this is the place that I can grow. This is the place where I can commit. This is the place where I can honor. God, I thank you for them right now, Father. We call them blessed from the crowns of their head to the soles of their feet. Father, I thank you for every person that had the courage to go and come down front. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, a double portion for them, Father. They put their feet to their faith. God, I thank you, God. I thank you for their awareness. I thank you for each staff member, Father. Pour back into them even as they pour out. Father, and I lift up Pastor David before you. I pray, I pray that you will continue to give him a double portion of your anointing. And as he pours out to thousands of people that he's impacting here in the Orlando and greater area, that you would pour back into him, pour back into his wife, Father, pour into his children who's sharing him with the world. God, we thank you right now in the name of Jesus that from this day forth, there shall be a culture of honor here in this church that they will honor him in their prayers, they will honor him in their presence, that they would honor him. We thank you. We give you the glory. 
We give you the honor and we give you the praise. Somebody shout in Jesus' name. Come on now, somebody shout in Jesus' name.